Hello and welcome to another episode of Methodantics, where we investigate dusty ideas. These are questions you may have always had about your worship experience or things in the building or songs you've sung, and maybe you've just been a little too afraid to ask them, as I often have. Uh, I am Justin Baer. I'm the Associate Director of Worship and Music here at St. Luke's, and I often have these questions, and I have often relied on Sid Davis to help me answer these questions. And so here he is, and he's gonna introduce himself and our topic for today. I'm Sid Davis. I'm the Director of Music and Fine Arts at St. Luke's United Methodist Church. And I'm happy to be back with you. And as we maybe get some questions answered for you, things have been floating around for a very long time. And uh, today's topic is what is on the page of the hymnal? I've said many times that this book is for you and me. It's, I'm a lay person just like you, and uh, oftentimes I think we think the hymnal is for the people behind the rail. That's not true. It's for all of us. And uh, there's a lot in there that will help us, uh, certainly interests us, and uh, it's there for you and me. So we hopefully will get some of those things answered today. Yeah, I, I like that we're doing this topic because it's, it seems really rudimentary, and in some ways it is, because we're going to be pointing out things that people are like, well, I mean, obviously, like there's a number on the page, yes. Um, but it, it kind of feels like, you know, worship that becomes really routine for people is sort of like seeing the movie but not reading the book, right? It's like, you know, I, I was never really much of a reader growing up and I liked movies because I was kind of lazy and they were a much easier way to, and much more entertaining way to explain what was happening in this story. And, so I would be annoyed at the people who would say like, well, the book was much better. Uh, and until like I actually started doing that and watching the movie and reading the book and going, they're kind of right. Uh, and that's how this, this feels a little bit is worship can be such a, a passive thing where you sort of, maybe you just stand in the pews and you just listen to the songs or you've heard them enough that maybe you sing along but you don't have to open the hymnal. Or maybe you open the hymnal and all you look at is just the words that are on the page. And this is, is, is that version of kind of reading the book where we open this up and go, this is maybe a lot of stuff you've been missing that we hope will, uh, will sort of intensify your experience with, with this book. Sure, I think it's, um, and I've thought for many years that all you have to do is crack the door open a little bit and give people a little information. Doesn't have to be much. I know I have much, but what little I have, I think if we can crack the door for people and help help them realize that um, many, it's easy to make assumptions in anything in, in worship, you know, that everybody understands this or knows where this comes from, but me. And it's not true. That's simply not true. Yeah. So, um, there are a number of things on a hymnal page and, and they were all going to point out. And because it's, it's one we've talked about before in Methodantics, and it's a really easy one to start because it's not number one per se, but it is the first one in our Methodist hymnal. It's number 57, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. And uh, we talked about, maybe as last week or a couple of weeks ago, kind of what you would expect beginning to end in a hymnal. And... Uh, it's kind of the, the theological order of these things, the, often the chronological order of these things. And so when you open up to number 57, you'll see on the left, the glory of the triune God. We talked about how that's, um, that's the theological kind of content of what you're about to experience. And these hymns are, are praise and thanksgiving hymns. So these are, are very quite literally praise songs. Um, and you can see that at the very top of your page. So the things that we would point out that are on this hymn page that you would want to see is the hymn number, the name of the hymn, obviously the words, the lyrics, the music itself. And then in the bottom right, you have the hymn tune, which is always recognizable because it's in all caps. And then you have a tune meter, which most of the time looks like numbers, but in this case, it's not numbers, it's two letters, which is, is common meter. Um, so, Sid, tell me what you know about Over a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Well, um, 
first of all, there are many more verses, like most Wesley texts, there are many more verses to this than the ones we sing. I think this one actually starts with, if you turn the page over to 58, you'll see uh, Charles Wesley's original poem, which is 18 verses long, eight, something like that. And this verse, this starts on like verse seven or something like that. Oh, the one, the part that we know of 4,000 times. It's been the first hymn in every official Methodist hymnal since the time of the Wesleys. There are some hymnals that don't start, that Methodist churches have, that don't start with the 4,000 times the same, but the official hymnals have all started with that. And I guess, you know, we sort of joke about this being the official, this is the national anthem of United Methodists. This is our, this is our song. And uh, certainly we sing it a lot. Uh, we know it well. It is, um, it's in our DNA. And it's a very, very Wesleyan text. This is a totally ridiculous analogy, but it's the first thing that came to mind. So I just have to say it. When I was in, oh gosh, I was probably in middle school. Um, 104 KRBE was just what everybody listened to. It was the cool one. And uh, there was this really, really stupid song called the Barbie song. And it, uh, I think the DJ accidentally played it twice in a row. And then it was like a request hour and somebody had called in and requested it. So because of that, then they played it a third time in a row. And then because it was just sort of a running joke now, they kept playing it and they played it. I think the story is that they played it 104 times. Oh my gosh. Straight. Which is, if, of course, it's like the most annoying song you, you could imagine, but it's also like very catchy. And so people go through these phases of being really angry about it and then laughing about it because it's a joke. But it almost feels like that's what would happen, that kind of like, this is funny, but I'm also really mad about this. If we could just, one Sunday, we just sang all 18 verses straight through of over a thousand tongues to sing. This is not a mistake. We're doing this on purpose, but it is better than the Barbie song, I'll tell you that. Well, it's packed with great theology too, very Methodist theology. So it, it would be a good one to sing all morning. It'd be a good one to sing all morning. So uh, this tune name is Asmon, is I guess how would you say that? Asmon. Mm -hmm. Asmon. Um, and uh, this can be translated to, like we talked about last week, you go back in the index, you can find a whole index of tune names and you could find any other uh, hymn that has this Asmon tune. And below that we have CM, which is common meter. So you could also go to the back to the meter index and look at what are all these hymns that have CM on these? And these are, these are common meter. What's another hymn that- Well, um, common meter, is. Uh, this sounds simplistic and I don't mean for it to. Common meter is called common meter because it's used so often, you find it so much and it's 8686. Um, and it really has more to do with the text than the actual tune itself. And that's how many syllables are in the text. So if you count the syllables, you'll find there are eight syllables in the first line and six in the next line and da da da, et cetera, et cetera. Which isn't always yeah. the same thing as notes because you could have like a syllable right. and a vowel or something that has like a lot of running exactly. notes. Right. It has to do with the text. Um, and you can find, and well, first of all, let me just say one quick thing about a, a hymn tune. If you, if anybody that's listening to us uh, wrote a hymn tune today, you could name it after anything. You could name it after your street. My, my hymn tune name could be Tappenbeck because that's the name of the street I live on. Or I could name it after, I could, uh, make a mashup of all my children's names, or I could call it Davis. The hymn tune name can be anything. And I've looked up Asmon before, and I, I either didn't find it, or it was unremarkable. I can't, I can't remember. But <laughs> the hymn tune name can be anything. I but um, I believe it's complainer. Is the there's one complainer. That's right. Sounds... Um, if you look at 378, which is Amazing Grace, you'll find that it too is common meter. So you could sing the tune, the text to uh, Oh, 4,000 Tongues to the tune of Amazing Grace or vice versa. They'll fit. Um, interchangeable. And again, as Justin and I have said probably too many times, if all the preachers were gone tomorrow and you found yourself having to have a worship service in your home, 
and you said, boy, I really like this text, but I don't know this tune, but there is a tune that you know, and it's interchangeable. They're both common meter, for example. You could sing the text you know to the tune you know. You could switch them up. And just as a, um, just as a note, there's just so much on every page. There's a story with every hymn. Um, and there's a story with every page of every hymn. It's everybody looks at this page, I did for the longest time and thought, oh, that's so nice. We have Native American Amazing Grace at the bottom. Actually, that's not Amazing Grace. Those texts are about the end times for some reason, and they've chosen to put them with Amazing Grace. So if you're at worshiping in a Native American church and the theme is the end times, you're in good shape because you got several there to choose from. I but, guess the, the sixth verse in English, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, I mean, that's very like Revelations, Eschaton. True. Centric, but it's. These it, are not that, but <laughs> they're close. Why they didn't, I don't know why they didn't put Amazing Grace Native American text in there. I have no idea. So it sounds like. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. That's right. It's a very interesting way to combine those. That's right. Or amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You can do that. Yeah. Isn't that cool? So one that, uh, one of the reasons I like my office where I am is I can hear the organ. So. Jim comes to, to practice a lot when I'm working in the afternoons or- You shouldn't tell Jim that. Don't tell Jim that? You shouldn't tell Jim that. That I can hear play it? More. Yeah, I'll just play oh, more. No, no, like, you know, I would text him and say like, you need to speed that up a little bit or uh, <laughs> like, I definitely, that's not, that's not right. You need to Missed a note. Up. And um, so it's, it's a fun little game. But because of that, I hear Oftentimes I would hear what he's planning to play for the service, whether it's a prelude he's chosen or it's the hymns that are in the service. And being fairly new to hymn tunes, I picked up on one called Elecombe. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just felt like I'm hearing this all the time. And I'd go back through and I would look at in this, this index, these hymns that are, that are Elecombe. And so 203, a little tabs in here so I didn't take too long. Hymn 203 is Hail to the Lord's Anointed, which when we're looking at what's on this page here, we have Christ's gracious life, so this is still Christological and promised coming. So Hail to the Lord's Anointed is, uh, is an Advent hymn. Um, and 278, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna is Elecom, and uh, that's an Easter him. So you've got these, these, the same theme that's kind of spread throughout the liturgical year. And the last one is 547, which is O Church of God United, which at St. Luke's we do a lot. Um, uh, at least we've done it several times since I've been here in the last year or so. And uh, that's, um, so like, I know that we've done these three hymns in separate times, separate ways for separate meanings, all throughout the liturgical year, but it's the same tune. It's catchy, it's an easy one to remember, and uh, just sort of kind of clarifies like how, how all of this was intended to work in the first place, which is everybody would know what this is called, or everybody would know, sing, sing these words with this tune, and they could put those things together. That's right. Uh, it's, it's important to note that um, not all hymns do this. Some meters are really complicated, the, the numbers of the meters are very complicated and long. They look more like a math problem than they do a hymn meter. And not all, not nearly all hymns can be interchanged tune and text, but many of them can, and that's very helpful to know. And it's also interesting to know that if you wanna sing O oh, 4,000 Tongues to Sing at a Methodist church in the UK, it's not gonna be the same tune, most likely. Um, and it's not wrong, it's just different. We have a tendency as Americans to think what we do is the right way, and it's just a different way. Driving on the other side of the left side of the road is just different. It's not wrong. And often a, a newer way. Yeah, it's right? true. Not even maybe like the original way, but just our way. Yeah, and I think probably in the UK, sometimes the tunes 
that they sing are, uh, some of them are closer to what the Wesleys knew than what we use. Um, there are definitely, my experience in being in church in the UK is they're, they're more complicated tunes than we're used to. Mm. Um, but it takes all kinds, it makes the world go around. When you were talking about meters, um, I mean, the variety of meters, some of them are, they're so strange. It's like, why did you even pick a meter? Like 11, four, seven, nine, like, is that even really a meter? And is anybody else ever gonna do that again? Right. Uh, for the one for Ellicombe is 7676D, which has a ton. It, it, feels, it feels very poetic. Mm -hmm. O church of God united to serve one common Lord, proclaim to all one message with hearts and glad accord. It's very iambic. Um, right. and, and the D means double, it means that happens twice. I did not know what, what that meant. It means double. I just assumed it, there was like a 7676A. No, no, that's, that's, that's pretty thing. That. <laughs> means double. Well, that's helpful to know. Um, and so you can take this, this 7676D and you can put it with a whole bunch of other tunes. And like the way that, the way that all of this works together makes me feel so much more like this is a really purposeful, comprehensive, um, not unlike when, when scripture is cross-referenced with itself or other verses, a lot of cross-references in the New Testament saying this is the original Old Testament passage that this is from, especially in the Gospels. Um, that's a lot of how this feels is how all this is interconnected. Um, it reminds me of a, a TED talk I heard years ago. I don't, I don't remember what the title of it is. I'll have to look that up. But it's this guy who plays, I think he's maybe a journalist sort of one of those just seekers of information and wants to write articles about this stuff. But he plays this game with Wikipedia and he'll read like the article of the day and then until he gets to a point where he's, uh, he'll read something he's never heard before and he'll click on that link that'll take him to another page and he'll read that page until he's got something he's never heard before and click on that link. And sort of his, his like discipline with this is that he'll keep doing this over and over for as long as it takes until he gets back to the page that he started on. And sometimes that can take just a few minutes if it's like a really related topic or something and it just sort of circles back on itself. And sometimes it just takes him to like the craziest places you wouldn't imagine are actually information that people know things about. Um, but that's kind of how this feels. It's like you could start with over oh, a thousand and you could pick, uh, you could pick an author or a composer or a hymn tune or a meter and you could just work your way through the entire hymnal with all these interconnected ways of understanding how this music was put together. That's right. And it's, you know, I've said many times also in here, every page has a story. And um, for example, um, as we were talking about earlier, there's a hymn called Christ Upon the Mountain Peak. It's practically unsingable, but it visually, on the page, visually, it represents, it, it does what it, it, it's poetic in sort of a 4D way. And um, if you took your pencil, which I don't encourage, and connected the dots of the melody, it forms mountains. And the accidentals or the sharps and flats are so um, prevalent that they look like rocks on the mountainside. And that was what it was supposed to be. Um, St. Francis wrote, uh, oh, um, all Creatures of Our God and King. And the story goes that he wrote that, uh, he was not at his home in Assisi, he was traveling, he came back home, he found out he had a, a terminal illness and he added this last verse that we have, which is, O oh, sister death, which means even death praises God. Um, and for example, we have a, um, Duke Ellington hymn. The, the very last hymn in the book is written by Duke Ellington. We don't sing it. It's a good hymn, real soloistic, so it's really easier for soloists to sing. But the book is so rich; it's it's uh, it just goes on and on and on. Well, in the comment about having um, a an author from the fourth century, like Saint Francis of Assisi, just also goes to show you that yes, like this was a, a lot of this was compiled, a lot of this was composed in the last maybe two hundred years. But there are ancient texts in here. There are things that are foundational to Christianity writ large. Um, 
that are contained in this book. And it's it's simply just a matter of like spending spending time in here and figuring these things out. Um, I think just adds so much depth. Right, our book, it's for us. I would hope to be as, I don't know, influential enough at some point to be like Justin of Houston, you know, like St. Francis of Assisi. Uh -huh. I don't think I'm ever, nobody's ever gonna call me Justin of Houston. I'm not even Sid of Tappenbeck, so I can't comment on that. Ooh, that's better though. Is it? It's I think it's smaller. I have a better chance of being Sid of Tappenbeck than you do Justin of Houston. That's very, that's very true. I need to narrow down my um, my demographic here, my, ge, my ge geography. So uh, that's a lot of what we wanted to talk about today, um, but exciting news. We're going to start a new section of Methodantics. We're calling Methodantics Mail. And we got our first, our first question. We always talk about our, our uh, email addresses at the end. Ask if you have any questions, anything you want to know about the service, anything you've experienced. And so we did receive our first Methodantics Mail. This one came from Anna Simpson, who is on our media team here at St. Luke's. Wonderful part of making sure everything on a Sunday morning happens as it should. And so she gets to, to see and experience a lot of these things uh, every single Sunday in the sanctuary, especially now that we're back in person. Um, and I love that she's, it, it made my day when I got this email because I love that it's, it's enough to, it's not enough to just sit in the room and, and know that you're in this space, but to want to know more about the space and, and even from behind a soundboard or from behind a camera, um, people worship in our sanctuary every Sunday. So she asked three questions um, and we're gonna answer, really we're gonna answer two of them. But the first question is, why do we use King's Hawaiian bread for our communion? And do all Methodist churches use that or is that specific to us? Um, and it's a great question. And my, my gut reaction is that, well, it's, it's delicious. If you've never had King's Hawaiian bread, then you, that's like the first thing you need to eat for dinner tonight. Um, but it's really, I feel like it's, it's a little bit deeper of a question of like, what, what are these communion elements? What do we use for communion elements? And why do we use those things? Um, so the, the bread originally for communion was unleavened bread. This goes all the way back to the Passover meal. There was unleavened bread. And that's a tradition, obviously, Christianity coming out of Judaism. This is a tradition they carried on. The bread at the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal, was unleavened bread. And that's like, I, I think most everybody knows what unleavened bread is. You're, you're talking like a, a pita, almost like a tortilla. This is very flat, really very dense. Um, and because communion for us, it's a sacrament and it's a symbolic, um, I guess, feature of our worship service. And so all across the board, as many churches that celebrate communion or as many different denominations as there are, there's all different views of exactly how this is supposed to go. And there's vocabulary and language to describe what communion is supposed to be. And so it comes in a lot of different forms, but for, for our part, so we practice communion through intinction, which is I grew up just passing the plates and these like tiny little mouse wafers and these tiny little cups of juice. And we would like pull out our little wafer and pull out our little cup. And I was like, I'm pretty sure this is not, this is not representative of whatever they had at the last supper, but you know, it's a dry cracker and that's fine. Uh, but for us, we practice intinction. So we actually, we stand up and we go to the middle aisle and we process down and um, bread is handed to us and we dip that bread in the juice and we partake and we go back and sit down. And uh, so like in a really functional way, like you talked about with the altar rails that just blew my mind is people would have dogs in the service and these altar rails would keep dogs away from bread and juice. Um, Hawaiian bread just stays together really well. And so when you have a few dozen or a few hundred people dipping in here, uh, if you had like really crumbly unleavened bread or other kinds of bread, then you've got like this kind of a soggy, gross mess of stuff floating on top. And it's, well, if communion could be unsavory, it feels a little <laughs> unsavory, but the bread stays together really well. It soaks up the juice really well. You're halfway to a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, 
and it's also I, easy to it's also easy to break yeah so like it comes in these big convenient loaves and it, it's it, i love that we uh we use jesus passage from um or paul's passage talking about the last supper that on the night he was betrayed he, he took the bread and he broke it and this is very physical breaking of this coming to saint luke's and experiencing that was the first time i ever saw that because we only ever did the tiny little wafer things i'd never actually seen a breaking of bread um so that's that's how i grew up too with little cups and little crackers and i've, I've heard it said that you know the message that sends is that god is stingy and um i don't know that i ever thought about that actually before but yeah we we certainly want it to be more meal like than than uh, something that feels mean or stingy yeah a, a book i read in seminary by a guy named john drain he said that those those tiny little wafers send the message of we want you to have some jesus but not too much that's right just a little bit just enough jesus to make it through the week daily bread um so this this next question is kind of in line with that first one which is uh the bread, if you've ever um, been in the church or you've ever passed by the break room after our 8.30 a.m. Um, communion services that we used to have, we're not quite back to yet, just for safety reasons, but uh, whatever was left of the loaf of bread, because that was used to just feed some people that were around the chancel or there's bread left over from uh, all the areas where we would serve, and all that bread would go into the break room and people would just eat that bread. I know that Pure Sounders would line up for that stuff because it's you know it's kind of like a sunday morning donut um and i knew a little bit about that when norlin was training me for for this job she made sure that when i would clear the altar after the service if there were any crumbs left on the altar you did not dump those crumbs in the trash can right after the elements have been consecrated they're supposed to be consumed and uh, in catholic churches the worship leaders would drink all the wine and all the breads consumed or you throw it out you pour it out into the earth and let the birds have it but it's not supposed to be discarded um it's supposed to be consumed yeah it's a uh, um in a very again kind of a symbolic way it's this thing that was you know it was made in a factory somewhere it it served really one purpose but then we the church uh, we adopted this thing. We took it in and we repurposed it. It now has a holy purpose. Right. Um, it's not to the level of like transubstantiation where the body and, and or the bread and the juice or bread and the wine become the body of Christ very literally, very physically, but it is consecrated. It has been now set apart for this holy purpose. It's a, it's a holy right. part of our service. And you don't just throw away holy things. Well, and it's it's important to note, too, that we use grape juice, um, and this is a true story, Mr. Welch of Welch's Grape Juice. Grape juice was invented for use. He was a Methodist, and it was invented so that people who were struggling with uh, alcoholism um, could take communion, and they wouldn't, you know, wine wouldn't be involved. Um, that's where that came from. Mr. Welch was was a Methodist. It was a long time ago, but he was Methodist. No idea. He he still makes some delicious juice. He does. Before that, there was no such thing as grape juice. Um, grapes were crushed to make wine, and that was the only thing that was made from them. Yeah. So um, I noticed again, kind of when I was training and sort of getting the lay of the land. There's a room called the sacristy. Uh, which is often just called the flower room because when we have these beautiful, huge arrangements, that's where they go. And that's where they're used for prep, but that's where all of our communion stuff is and all of our altar pyramids. Um, and there was a sign on there that I noticed early on and uh, it was actually put up by, I think a former altar, altar guild member or somebody who used to just help out with that a lot. But it was a quote from the Methodist book of worship. And this is, instruction for people who were cleaning up communion after a service. And it, the quote is, what is done with the remaining bread and wine should express our stewardship of God's gifts and our respect for the holy purpose they have served. So it was very much a like, don't put this in the trash can. Let the birds or worms or somebody eat it outside. Right, that's right. Put this in the trash can. It, it wasn't only special for 30 minutes. It's still right. special, right? Yeah, 
even to be eaten by a bunch of hungry teenagers. That's right. And they do. <laughs> and they do. So we always like to end with a question that lets you in on a little bit of personal information about us. We've talked about, are we night owls? Do we go to bed early? You know, what do we eat? What are we reading, et cetera. And today we're gonna to talk about our pets. So I will begin and tell you about, we have one dog and one cat. Um, Maisie is our, is our puppy and she's very sweet. She's the light of our lives. And uh, she's a Havani, Havanese and Shih Tzu. She's, they call them Velcro, dog, Velcro dogs because they want to be touched all the time. She's very sweet. And we have a kind of insane cat named Iggy. Iggy was a rescue cat. She was found under the hood of a car as a kitten, under the hood of a car in August. And I don't think she ever recovered. She's, she's pretty crazy. And her name, Iggy, is short for ignition since she was found in a car. Nice. Those are our pets. You gotta, you gotta have a good pet name. You do. It's a good pet name. Uh, we have one pet and we've had him now for almost nine years. His name is Simon. He is a very large golden doodle. Uh, we adopted him. Uh, I was student teaching, it was 2012. I was student teaching and a friend of ours had gone to DFW um, Humane Society and she had picked up a dog and said, there's one more left. And so I actually left work that day. I got permission from my, my master teacher and we drove over and um, we, we picked him up. But because he's adopted, we don't actually know like what his entire pedigree is, but we're pretty sure he was like a golden doodle bred with a Great Dane uh, because he is, he is very, very big. Um, at one point he got up to about 120 pounds and he has these very long legs. Uh, in fact, when we first got him, we were in an apartment complex with a 50 pound dog, Max. And within a couple months, he had surpassed that. And then we were like, well, he wasn't, but now he is. Does that count? I don't know. I don't know what we have to do. Um, and he's, he's an awesome, fuzzy, cuddly dog. He's given us our sh fair share of problems. He likes to eat socks and not so much anymore. Now he's just old and chill, but he, he did eat many, many socks. Um, and squeakers and things that just made for a lot of really late nights taking care of Simon. He got his name, it's not as cool as Iggy, but he got his name because I was really into audiobooks for a while and I was listening to sort of an, I was kind of an armchair, like astrophysicist uh, enthusiast, I guess. So I was reading a lot of like Stephen Hawking books and Kip Thorne and, uh, one book I was reading was read by a really snooty British guy named Simon Preble. And so Simon was like a common name in our house at that time. And so when we were trying to name him, we kept just like sort of shouting names that were at the top of our head and just seeing what he responded to. And the first time we said Simon, he looked right up at us. And so we thought, okay, I guess. I guess I he was just waiting for you to land on it. We just waiting for it. He was almost Oliver. He was this close to Oliver. And uh, he has a brother, that'd be good. Simon and Oliver. That would be good. No plans for or Garfunkel, one of the two. Also good. So that's it for us this week. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our look through a hymn page, and we hope that it was really helpful for you. Um, as we did receive our first Methodantics mail this week, uh, you are always welcome to email us and ask us any questions or ask us what we may end up covering in a later episode. We'd love to interact with you about this stuff and get information to you guys that'll help you worship more deeply. My email is jbear at stlukesmethodist.org. Sid Davis is sdavis at stlukesmethodist.org. We'd love to hear from you guys and we hope you have a great week. Thanks for coming. Bye.